Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my genuine pleasure and distinct honor as the director of the Baker Institute to welcome you here tonight to this very special Shell Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. As some of you may know, the Baker Institute Energy Forum has been studying the emerging energy needs of Asia as a critically important element of our global oil equation. India's energy industry looms large as a major player on the international oil scene. India is the world's sixth largest energy consumer and imports close to 70% of its oil needs. Given India's current outstanding rate of economic growth, it's truly one of the most dynamic economies in the world, around 7% annually, these needs are likely to continue to expand. India is expected to become the fourth largest con world's consumer of energy by 2010. Its state oil firm, ONGC, has invested $3 billion in overseas exploration and energy projects since the year 2000. And India remains an important area outside of OPEC for exploration activities to find new resources of oil and gas. Given India's important place in the world's energy market, we are delighted to join together with the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Houston to welcome His Excellency Murli Deora, Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Mr. Deora is accompanied this evening by Mr. Srinivasan, India's Petroleum Secretary. As Houston is the world's energy capital and the Indo-American Chamber is a key organization representing our vibrant Indian community here in Houston, I cannot think of a better event for us to co-host than one that will allow us to learn more about India's energy strategy. Recently, the Baker Institute embarked on an ambitious two-year research program on the role of the national oil companies in international energy markets. State-owned companies like India's ONGC continue to play a central role in international oil and gas markets. Given their lion's share of global energy reserves, the influence of these national firms on oil markets and geopolitics is large, likely to expand in the decades to come. Our Energy Forum, under the direction of Amy Jaffe, has assembled an international team of scholars and experts to investigate the full range of economic and political issues that will shape the future of national oil companies. As a central part of this research program, the Forum has and will be inviting select government officials and corporate executives, such as Minister Diara, to speak on a subject here at the Institute and to help us understand the important responsibilities and strategies of countries with national oil companies. We thank our Energy Forum sponsors for their generous support in making this study on the national oil companies possible and Shell for sponsoring this lecture series. I would now like to turn the podium over to Mr. Somesh Singh, President of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Houston and Vice President and General Manager for the Identity Management Business Unit of BMC Software. Mr. Singh will be introducing our distinguished speaker this evening. Mr. Singh. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, uh, Jarejian. Uh, that uh, introduction was uh, a wonderful way to start this meeting. Uh, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce was created or uh, founded for, for one singular reason, and that was, and still remains, to create opportunities for better uh, trading relationship between India and United States. Uh, our two great countries have tremendous potential to, uh, to work together and create, uh, create wealth and spread democracy around the world. Uh, over the past few years, with the help of a very strong Indo-American community, as well as uh, help from our uh, uh, consulate here in, uh, in Houston, uh, Indo-American Chamber of Commerce has become a resource for everyone who wants to do uh, trade with India and we want to continue to, to enhance that. When policy makers from New Delhi uh, visit the United States, it is a unique opportunity for us to bring together decision makers, and I'm really thankful to Baker Institute and Rice Alliance to, to give us this opportunity and help us in uh, creating an event like this. Uh, it is now my pleasure 
to introduce His Excellency uh, Murli Devla, uh, Indian uh, Minister of uh, uh, Oil and Gas and uh, Petroleum and Oil and Gas. Uh, growing up in Bombay, I knew of Mr. Devla as Mayor of uh, Bombay Municipal Corporation. And before I go any further, let me uh, make sure that I put Mr. Devla's mind at ease. BMC Software does not stand for Bombay Municipal Corporation Software. <laughs> <laughs> Bombay Municipal Corporation has not stopped filling the uh, potholes, and they have not gone and started making software. <laughs> Mr. Deva has been deeply involved in uh, various civic uh, activities. He has, been, uh, he has had a stellar career uh, spending his time in promoting industry, uh, industrial development, education, uh, and social work. He, is, uh, uh, he, has been, he has spent a lot of time bringing technology to poor and underprivileged uh, uh, people all over the country. And over 30 cities have benefited from his, uh, his effort in India. Uh, he's vice president of, uh, 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 of uh, Indian uh, Red Cross Society. He's also vice president of uh, International Red Cross Society and International Red Crescent Society. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, His Excellency Murli Deva. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again. I'm trying to see that I don't make a mistake in pronouncing your name. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Derejian, Dr. Somesh Singh, my colleague, the Secretary of the Ministry, Honorary Consul General of India, Mr. Gawai, and friends. First, I would like to share one minute with you I studied in India, but I was an exchange student during my school days and I lived in America. And I see for years or for decades, the relations between our two great countries are growing, growing and growing. But I also remember the time when no American was welcome in India. I also remember when it, would, it was difficult for an American to start and do any business in, in India. But now, the, the doors of India are open. It was July 1991 when Dr. Manmohan Singh, the present Prime Minister of India, he became the Finance Minister of India. And I remember that was the day when he announced <coughs> the new industrial policy for India. There was a time when in order to manufacture any product, we would need a license. And we used to call it license permit Raj. The secretaries were very powerful that time. <laughs> that doesn't mean they are not powerful now. <clears throat> and I, ca I can tell you examples, one or two examples, whereby the policies were so wrong that, <clears throat> that, that we were allowed to import a product rather than allow the multinational companies to manufacture them there. I remember once in the parliament, I had a fight with one of my leftist communist friend and the product was some antibiotic which was <coughs> manufactured by Pfizer pharmaceutical company in America. Now the Pfizer company in India, they were not given a license to manufacture them. But the India's public sector company, IDPL, Indian Drug Pharmaceutical Company, they were allowed to have a tie-up with the Russian company. So you can understand the know-how or the technology was given by American Pfizer company to the Russian company and the Russian company were transferring the know-how or the technology to the Indian company. This was the time. This is the way the government's policies were working. I remember another thing. There was something called DGTD. Srinivasan will know. Director General of Technical Development. It would take two years <coughs> to get a permission from the government to get an import license. I started my own small plastic company during the late 60s or early 70s. 
and i remember it took 2 years to get a import license to import a uh, import a cowtex blow molding machine from germany so that was a different time and now now whether you are american or not if you are american certainly you are welcome but anybody can come and start do any business in india or manufacture anything in india i would like to say one line on the fdi foreign direct investment it was a taboo i mean it was very difficult for any foreign company to invest in india in various areas but now most of the products which are manufactured in india 100% foreign exchange is allowed today we are in houston and yesterday we were in houston for the simple reason of inviting people to to explore the oil in the oil fields which we are trying to rent them in india in different parts of india so this is the change we have occurred in india and today i am given a subject on energy security of india which i would like to present to you i deem it as a great privilege to be here at the prestigious baker institute i have been asked to share my views on the sensitive and complex issue of energy security for india the subject of energy security has come to be of primary concern for all nations it is evident that any nation or society which does not plan for its energy security is bound to face serious developmental challenges in the near future what can what then can be legitimately described as energy security of a nation in 1999 undp report defined energy security as the continuous availability of energy in varied forms in sufficient quantities at reasonable prices for india the pari committee report recently stated that a country is energy secure when it can supply energy to all its citizens and meet their demand for safe and convenient energy at affordable cost at all times with a prescribed confidence level considering shocks and disruptions that can be expected you may notice that in the later definition affordable rather than reasonable prices has been used i will come back come back to the significance of this distinction shortly and defined it to be a crucial component for energy security for a developing nation like india relationship between energy consumption and growth of a nation is well documented in fact it is the steady economic rise of india and china that is substantial su substantial measure has placed the issue of energy security on the forefront this growth is also inaccurately and simplistically portrayed as one important cause for the unprecedented rise in the world oil market however with nearly a sixth of the world's population in india it should be appreciated that india's energy consumption remains modest at a fifth of the world average per capita energy consumption the india consumes 520 kilograms of oil equivalent per capita of primary energy con compared to 1090 1090 by china and 7835 by united states of america energy security has emerged as a primary concern for indian policy makers because of our increasing dependence on imported oil oil import constitutes over 72% of our total oil consumption and 26% of our total primary commercial energy supply the dependence on imports of oil causes us two main concerns the first is the uncertainty regarding the oil supply and the second is the volatility we spend today more than 26 billion dollars only on oil import any disruption in access to energy can be very expensive in welfare terms as energy is critical for economic growth and for human survival and very well being of us energy security consideration for india will therefore require number 1 ensuring availability of energy sources 
through domestic efforts or through long term supply agreement or through buying assets abroad an elaborate dis distribution network for domestic supplies development of infrastructure to cope with the growing demand in terms of storage import import terminals etc and energy conservation fourth is alternate and diverse sources of energy and the needed r&d to grow our energy supply in an environmentally responsible manner above all institutional and policy mechanism to ensure an equitable supply of energy both in terms of reaching underdeveloped regions and in terms of the economically backward sections of our society as a political representative i cannot but emphasize the last issue that is the need to address the requirements of economically depressed classes i'm sure all of us present here would agree that energy insecurity takes the heaviest and the cruelest toll on the weaker sections of our society first non availability of domestic fuel due to high prices or general lack of the commodity creates concerns of livelihood environmental degradation and indeed of survival among the underprivileged it is estimated that every dollar increase in oil prices takes away one of one day's worth of subsistence for 60% of the world population for a growing country like india thus the challenge is much more complex than simple simple availability of energy india needs economic growth for the development of its 1 billion plus human resources for the 8 to 10% growth that the country aspires for both the quantity and the quality of energy supply has to improve we need clean convenient and reliable energy today india's energy mix is still dominated by coal and constitutes over 50% of our energy in that basket this is followed by oil and gas at 45% and gas holding just above 8% share nuclear energy is little more than 2% as india is relatively late starter in the trajectory of growth we have the benefit of hindsight and the lessons from experiences of other nations you will be surprised to note that energy intensity for india which was 1% plus in 1990 today is pegged at 0.75% this implies that for every 1% increase in gdp gdp our increase in energy requirements are much less than those of many other countries looking into the future it seems that in 2020 fossil fuels will continue to dominate india's energy mix to the extent of 75% with hydro power contributing 14 and nuclear energy 6.5 India has crafted a multi-pronged strategy to counter the challenge of fueling India's economic growth. There has been a conscious shift so as to promote larger public-private regulatory board bill 2006. With the passage of this this bill, only last week we passed this bill, a regulatory bill, in in the parliament. And with the passage of this bill, the path has been paved to put a fully equipped regulatory body for the downstream and midstream sector in place thus a crucial building block for enhanced private investment and protection of the interests of all stakeholders is now in place the bill this bill provides the legal framework for building for much needed gas pipeline infrastructure to facilitate the marketing and distribution of gas the various strategy to achieve our energy security objectives can be summarized as india still remains a vastly under explored country domestic acreages and frontier basins are now being increasingly brought under expo exploration and production under the new exploration licensing policy in this regard some of the recent discoveries by a private sector company called reliance and gujarat state corporation offshore in the east coast and by can in rajasthan 
have opened entirely new vistas in the exploration of oil and gas in our country. Simultaneously, we have also taken up meth methanol extraction from coal. This year, we have launched the third round of CBM blocks. We are expecting first commercial production of CBM in the year 2007. In addition to the accelerated exploration programs, schemes to enhance oil production from the existing reservoirs have been put in place. Our national oil company, ONGC, has taken up a US $2.7 billion investment plan in these schemes in 15 fields to enhance oil production by elevating its recovery factor for oil. In defining and marketing, India has already introduced liberal policies in investments in the refining sector are open and com companies can invest who, companies who invest over 20 billion indian rupees say 450 million us dollar in the domestic oil gas sector are also given rights to market petroleum products in india directly they can market the policy on pricing of petroleum products has been detailed with the objective of equitable access to the economically weak sections of our society. Another important component of our oil and gas security is to acquire equity oil and gas assets outside India. Indian companies have succeeded in getting a significant foothold and are currently operating in 14 countries with a production of about 100,000 barrels per day of oil and oil equivalent gas in Sakhalin, Sudan, Sudan and Vietnam. Sudan is in Russia, as you know. In addition to accelerating efforts at home and through international participation, India sees enhancement in its energy security through building energy corridors for supply of oil, gas across and within our border. To develop alternate fuels in this regard, considerable efforts are underway for production, production of biodiesel fuels. To ensure steady supply of energy, it would be prudent to introduce and enable developing econom economies to use new technologies for enhancing their energy security. This shall not only enable efficient and more productive use of their resources, but would also help the world in improving many technologies viable through higher and larger commercial uses. Technologies in the field of gas hydrates, coal gasification, gas to liquids, coal bed methane, ultra deep exploration and production are lesser known in the developing world. The time has come that the world collectively shares the responsibility of sustainable development and elevation in the equity of life of the masses. India is exploring possibility to meet its energy requirements from various sources of energy, whether through fossil fuels, thermal power, hydroelectric or nuclear power. In this regard, US and United States and India have initiated the Indo-US Energy Dialogue, which would provide a meaningful exchange of information and a forum to help us in planning and implementing our agenda for, for energy security. The recent agreement between United States of America and India during the visit of American President George Bush on civil, civil nuclear energy cooperation marks a historical turning point in our ever-increasing cooperation and mutual understanding between our two countries. India has always been engaged in a peaceful nuclear energy program to meet its growing energy demand. The measure will, this measure will help India in adding its power generation capacity. Nuclear energy would make the country less dependent on oil and gas and will also be environmentally friendly. The strategic agreement between India and the United States of America on civil nuclear cooperation can, can be seen as a partnership between the world's oldest and the world's largest democracy in working together for a more secure world. The agreement makes a milestone in the Indo-US partnership. As President Bush expressed during his just concluded visit to Delhi, I quote, the partnership between our nations 
has the power to transform the world this is what george bush said our cooperation should cover the entire energy spectrum india has already agreed to participate in the future generation program for zero emission thermal power plants and integrated ocean drilling program for gas hydrants i would stress that india and the usa partner and initiate an institutional process of ensuring global energy security and lay the foundation of a new beginning to realize the vision of a secure sustainable equitable efficient and productive global energy market i conclude by quoting the indian prime minister in in the parliament during that time when george bush was visiting india dr manmohan singh who aptly summed summed up the challenges in the following terms i quote the search for an integrated policy with an appropriate mix of energy supplies is central to the achievement of our broader economy or social objectives energy is the life blood of our economy without sufficient and predictable access our aspirations in the social sector cannot be realized i believe that the needs of the people of india must become the central agenda for our international cooperation it is precisely this approach that has guided our growing partnership with united states thank you very much has kindly agreed to answer some questions and I know we have the secretary here and also uh, Secretary Voshi to help us uh, uh, so that we can get a wide range of perspectives if the minister would like to also ask uh, uh, some of the other members to participate as well. Um, we have uh, quite a stack and I know the minister has a tight schedule and we have a nice reception afterwards so I'm going to try to uh, clump the questions together into areas of interest. Um, there uh, is a lot of interest in, um, in the role of ONGC in the international community and I guess in light of uh, China's acquis attempted acquisition of UNICAL uh, we have several questions on whether or not uh, India could foresee an interest by uh, ONGC to acquire or take a stake in a U.S. company. Please. You know how our democracy works. I, have, I spent 25 years in the Indian Parliament and we always make a fun when a new minister is appointed. The parliamentarians, when he becomes a minister, he is supposed to know everything even though he may not be knowing anything about the subject. <laughs> and I belong to that category myself. <laughs> <coughs> I have just become a six weeks, uh, I am a minister for this department. And I always say that for six weeks, I'm on a crash training program from the officers. But I would like to answer some questions. Some questions I will direct to the Secretary General and other colleagues are here. You ask whether ONGC, India's, no, India's Any interest oil company. in getting more active in the US market possibly through an acquisition or through investment? To, to explore in what you said? No. By another company? I don't know. I don't think so. Just now there is any program, but I would like uh, Secretary to say that. You come. Uh, the question is whether ONGC is active in acquiring certain companies in the United States. Very much the answer is yes. Now the possibility is it could be a technology company. For instance, coming to survey and exploration, 
areas such as data acquisition, processing, interpretation, these play a very frontal role in exploration today. So technology savvy, technology strong companies are possible targets for acquisition. In fact, some of our marketing companies and also upstream companies including Oil India Limited and ONGC, they are in the process of negotiating with certain European companies for the purpose of wholesale acquisition. And some of the smaller technology strong companies in the United States, they are already in discussion with ONGC. Incidentally, two, three years ago, ONGC had acquired an exploration interest in one of another blocks. Later, for certain commercial reasons, this was transferred to a sister company. Very interesting. Okay, well, the next set of questions um, are sort of in the same topic line. Uh, a lot of people in the audience have, have, have yes. observed that um, uh, technology transfer, which is very important for India's uh, energy industry, uh, a lot of that comes through partnering with uh, other companies, uh, companies like the uh, international oil companies, the majors, and, and others who are active in exploration. And so the question is, um, number one, um, what is India's government thinking to do to ensure both ways to attract and promote uh, participation by the international companies and also transfer of technology, but at the same time uh, promote activity by domestic Indian companies. And we had one question uh, asking if there was any intention to try to get a more momentum to the trend that we see here in the United States with small independent uh, oil companies becoming more active in exploration in India. Uh, Anything on exploration, the secretary replies. I'll, <laughs> I'll explore the possibility of answering it. <laughs> the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation is our local upstream premier national oil company. Now, with a view to making India an attractive destination for exploration in our local sedimentary basins, it is a, it's, it's a matter of policy framework. One is regarding how attractive a country is perceived to be for foreign direct investment. Yes. And how sectorally we frame our policy in order to be able to woo companies from abroad, either in the field of technology or in the field of project related investments. Now coming to our specific area, exploration, the answer is the new exploration licensing policy framework which was initiated sometime in 1999 was specifically aimed at attracting foreign companies to come and explore in our sedimentary basins. Now the success of this policy framework is evident from the fact that in ELP round one, we put forth 48 blocks on offer, only 24 were picked up. Round five, which we launched last year, we offered 20 blocks, all the 20 were snapped up. That's what has given us, in fact, increasing confidence. This time we are coming out of the largest ever single offer of 55 blocks for exploration. What we do is, after every round is over, we undergo a process of white consultation with the stakeholders. The companies which are doing actual exploration, the companies which have been showing interest, but somehow they were hesitant to test the waters, all of them we call apart from our own national oil companies and also leading private companies like Reliance, SR and others, we call them all, we go through a wide round of discussions. What is it that they want? What is it they were disappointed with in the earlier rounds? All this is distilled and then we try to fine tune the next policy round documentation. That is what has been giving us dividends. And the level playing field to all. And we provide a level playing field. In fact, that is one of the pillars of or the bedrocks of uh, the foreign direct investment policy. It's called the level playing field. Whether it's a foreign player or a local player, it's, it's all the same. For instance, in our exploration round, a national oil company has to compete on equal terms with a foreign company. No preferences. That's okay, now I have a question for the minister. Uh, several oh, people. Can you be sure that it's, I, 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 it's definitely a question for the minister. <laughs> Give me a minute. Uh, the audience would like to know, be, even though you're new to the job, but uh, still very knowledgeable about India and its priorities, they would like to know what you consider the top priority for India's energy industry moving forward. Okay. <clears throat> the top priority is first, we must explore or produce 
our own fields oil and gas because then the cost will be very very low the second top priority will be to explore oil fields in other countries like we have in russia we have in vietnam we have in sudan and the third is go to the other alternate fuels and the fourth have other uh, uh, renewable energies like s- solar energy like wind mills etc but i would say even though the government is promoting these ideas but we are at a very initial stage at at the moment so we will continue to depend on the import of oil which is more than 70% i said and uh, we will continue to explore more and more oil wells the secretary rightly said this was possibly this is the only only policy where there is no special preference is given to a local party or the governmental public sector undertaking what is said rightly like in this case ongc which is government owned company and reliance which is totally private owned company they have to go, go the same way same conditions same transparency is applied to the government company as much to the foreign or indian a private company. Okay, the next question, since we're here in the energy capital and the big buzz in Houston these days is our shortage of manpower. Believe it or not, we're having a shortage of manpower, <coughs> especially in engineering. So I have several questions. Uh, one is, how can the U.S. help to increase the number of jobs for engineers from India to participate in the international energy industry? And what should we expect in return? Uh, another one, uh, can the Ministry of Petroleum request to the U.S. government to grant more visas to Indian engineers to meet the manpower needs of the petroleum industry in the United States? Um, can you address a little bit uh, your views on the manpower issue? The, last week I, I read in the newspapers that the U.S. or your State Department has been very kind to increase the H-1 visa applications of Indians to come to America, the quota was increased. When President Bush was in Delhi, a question was asked to him, and he was very sincere, I must say, to, to, to be more liberal uh, in sending Indian engineers abroad. But I must say, more and more people are going to the Silicon Valleys and in the IT business, less in the oil exploration or the engineers who, can become, who will be coming to Houston and the oil areas. But if you, if you think there, there is a scope for more Indian engineers, India will be very happy to send them. We promote that. We depend greatly on the money transferred, sent by our engineers and scientists working abroad. Thank Whatever. you. Okay, uh, we also had several questions about the collaboration between India and China on energy strategy. Wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Well, India and China are the two biggest consumer of oil and energy products. And there are areas where we cooperate with them very well. Even some areas we bid together, China and India. And uh, there's no problem uh, for, for be- between India and China on any issue. Anything you want to say about China? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, India and China, they are going to account for the highest proportion of the incremental energy demand over the next two decades. And uh, there are instances where uh, competition between them at an international competitive bidding case, uh, in fact, when we compete, the seller is very happy. When we do not compete, they are unhappy because I think collaboration brings down the realization for the seller. But in spite of that, uh, in fact, there are a few occasions where we have jointly preferred bids. But competition appears to be inevitable. Okay, well, I'm going to let the minister relax in a minute because I know he's had a long trip, but I'm going to ask one controversial question of geopolitics because, after all, we are the Baker Institute. So would the minister be willing to comment on the question of gas imports from Bangladesh? Gas import from Bangladesh or passing through Bangladesh? Yes. I said that that we must explore the every possibility to get more gas and more oil. We have a program whereby we will have a pipeline from Iran. You must have read about this. That is from Iran, Pakistan, India. The second alternative is, what you call that? Turkmenistan. 
तुर्कमेनिस्तान अफगानिस्तान पाकिस्तान एंड इंडिया टैप और टैपी नाउ एंड द थर्ड प्रपोजल वॉज टू ब्रिंग गैस फ्रॉम म्यानमार थ्रू बांग्लादेश दिज आर ऑल अंडर कंसिडरेशन बट द देर मे दिस मे मेटरलाइज बट आई कॉन्ट से नाउ दे आर एट अ वेरी इनिशियल स्टेज जस्ट नाउ बट इट मे हैपन दैट वी गेट गैस फ्रॉम बांग्लादेश और वी गेट द मैनमार पाइप लाइन थ्रू बर्मादेश इट कैन इट कैन नॉट आई कैन नॉट से दैट जस्ट नाउ वेर इज टू टू अर्ली और टू प्रीमेचर Well thank you very much minister and secretary for for a wonderful Q&A session we invite you all back uh for a nice reception with the minister and thank everybody for coming. Thank you.